once again, it's, it's, a, it's a joy to be with you. Um, when I gave my little abbreviated bio just now, I didn't mention the fact that I love Jesus. I've followed him just about all my life, um, sometimes well, sometimes not so well, um, but he's been very faithful to me. And um, I delighted to hear the comments and the prayers of people already today. When I heard from Rob that he was going to meditate on a psalm, I thought to myself, well, there's a one in 150 chance that he's going to pick the same chart, psalm that I'm preaching on this morning. Um, he didn't, but it was nice that we've got, you've got two psalms today. So once you've finished meditating on Psalm 131 during the week, you can meditate on the psalm I'm going to read to you. I want to read to you what I think is one of the most remarkable psalms in, in the 150 that we have in our Bibles. Um, it's remarkable because it gives an astonishingly detailed um, depiction of the sufferings of Jesus on the cross and the words that he spoke. I'll come back to that later, but I particularly want to concentrate on the second remarkable thing about this psalm, is that it shows us the path from despair to hope that the psalmist takes and that we can take as we go on that journey with him. Now, some of you may have been trying to guess what psalm it is I'm going to read. Um, and if you want to follow me, I'm going to read most of Psalm 22. As I read it, I want you to notice, and I'll try and reflect this in the, the tone of my voice, I want you to notice the way the writer of this psalm, which is David, it's one of David's psalms, um, so it's a psalm that he composed and also sang. I'm going to read it, I'm not going to sing it. Um, and he, um, we're told in the heading of the psalm that it was according to the doe of the dawn, which doesn't mean very much to me, but it's just kind of a, a, a heading. We get no clue as to when it was written, but I'll come back to that later. Uh, Rob mentioned just now that some psalms are prayers and some are more sort of introspective reflections, and this psalm is really a mixture of both. But the thing I want you to notice is the way the psalmist run, seem to swing from despair and despondency and bitter hopelessness to then swings back to hope. But he doesn't do it in a sort of circular way, sort of going round and round and not really gaining anything. There is a progression during this psalm. And if you get nothing else from what I say this morning, I want you to just enjoy this psalm and see how the progression the psalmist takes is a progression we can take when we find ourselves in a position where all things seem to be going very badly wrong. Okay, my God, <clears throat> my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night. I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I, <clears throat> but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust at my mother's breast, on you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me they open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion i'm poured out like water all my bones are out of joint my heart is like wax it's melted within my breast my strength is dried up like a potsherd my tongue sticks to my jaws you lay me in the dust of death dogs encompass me a company of evil doers encircle me they have pierced my hands and feet i count all my bones they stare and gloat over me they divide my garments among them for my clothing they cast lots but you, O Lord, do not be far off. 
Oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life and power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. Lord, I pray that as we look for a moment at this psalm, that you will speak to us from it. It's a psalm, some of which we're quite familiar with, some of us, because of its remarkable depiction of the, our Jesus on the cross. But help us also to learn from it as how you can apply some of these progressive principles, as it were, in our own lives. So, Lord, please, I pray that my words will be your words as we talk together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Over the past few months, we have heard plenty of stories, plenty of tragic human stories. We've tuned in this week to the news and we thought things couldn't get any worse than they are. And we find ourselves looking at the destruction in Beirut. We find ourselves looking at the desperation in the eyes of migrants crossing the channel in dreadfully flimsy vessels and we think can it get any worse many of us don't need to look at our television screens many of us have stories of our own or stories of our family and friends stories of hopelessness and despair and sadness and disappointment stories of people and i don't know you maybe you've had this experience of having to say goodbye to a loved one and at a distance, someone taken from you. There have been stories like that. There have been stories of families that have had to say to their children, I'm sorry, you can't go on holiday after all. I don't, I'm not looking for pity, but we've had that ourselves. If we go on a family holiday next week, we try and find a few days in the year when we can all go away with my children and grandchildren. One of my daughters and her three daughters lives in Huddersfield, and so they've been told, sorry, you can't go. They could go away on their own, but they can't come away and mix with their family. And that's sort of, that's minor compared with a lot of things, but it's just sad. As far as the children are concerned, it's huge, but that's the way it is. And of course, there have been people who have had to say to each other, couples have had to say to, other, to each other, you know, this business that we've been working hard to set up, well, I'm afraid it isn't going to survive. And so, the question arises, um, if I'm a Christian, does it make any difference? Does knowing God make any difference to the difficult decision, difficult situation I might be facing? Or is there a sense even that the fact that I know God and believe him to be a loving, caring God, does that make it even more problematic, the fact that things go badly wrong in my life or in the lives of people? around me. And the question I want to pose today, just to consider a few minutes as we reflect on this psalm, is if that's something you're facing, or if that's something you're helping someone face, where is God in the difficulties that I'm encountering? What do we do about it? How do we respond? What do we say? And that's why I want to look at this psalm. Because you see, Probably there are two ways in which people respond to these things. There are, and I'm talking to people who've got a faith in God. Some would, through gritted teeth, maybe say, maybe you do this. Well, I trust in God. I believe that God knows best. I'll just have to leave everything with him and just put up with the way things are. There's an element of faith in that. There's an element of sense in that. At the, others, the other extreme, if you like, and we see both of these things in the Psalms, is a response which says, this is not fair. And you shout at God, you scream at God, you say to God, why don't you do something about it? Where were you when I needed you? Now there's an element of what's right about both of those approaches. And we see both in the Psalms, but probably we see more of the latter than the former. 
we see more shouting at God and complaining at God than just putting up with things. And I want to say to you that God actually doesn't mind us complaining to him. God doesn't mind us crying out to him and saying, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? My God, my God, why, have you let, why don't you hear my cries? Because, and this is the important thing, because to do that is often to set ourselves on a road to discovering hope, a road to restoration, a path which we wouldn't go down were we not to start in that shouting mode. Okay, let's come back to the psalm. Now, some of the psalms of David, we know where they're written. Some of the, when they're written, some we don't. Um, we don't have on this psalm a useful heading which says this was written when David did this, that, or the next thing. So we can only imagine. And I want to suggest to you that this was written by David or sung by David um, at a point in his life which was probably the lowest point that he ever got to. You'll read the story. I haven't got time to read the whole story, but um, when you finish meditating on Psalm 131 during this week, um, and when you reflect a little bit on Psalm 22, turn over to 1 Samuel, and the last five chapters of 1 Samuel tell the story in the life of David when he came to a point of despair. And when I just think it's possible, it was the time he wrote this psalm. Let me tell you briefly what happened. David had been, was being chased by Saul, and he decided in order to relieve himself or, or get away from Saul's clutches, he would go and join the enemy. So he go, went and joined the Philistines, the, the traditional historic enemy of the Israelites, and joined them, and then Saul wouldn't come after him. And it worked. Saul didn't come after him. And David had a period of peace. He decided to fight for the Philistines rather than for the Israelites. A remarkable, astonishing, crazy thing to have done. But then it came to the point where the Philistines were going to go into war against the Israelites, and they wisely decided it wasn't a good idea to have David with them because he could easily turn coat and become and go and fight for the other side. So they sent him packing. David was pretty upset about this because he quite enjoyed pretending to be a Philistine, and he went back. But that disappointment was nothing compared with the fact that when he got back to the town which the Philistines had given him as a sort of base to look after, a town called Ziklag, he found that another enemy of theirs, the Amalekites, had in the meantime completely destroyed that town, burnt it to the ground, and What's more, his wives, he had two wives, don't ask me why, but he had two wives, and they were both kidnapped, both taken away. I'll, read, I'll just read a, just a couple of verses from that, from that bit. It says that when David and his men came to the city, in his chapter 30 of 1 Samuel, they found it burnt with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Israel, Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But, this is the verse I'm going to leave you, but, it says, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. There was nobody around David to strengthen him. Nobody to find encouragement from him. He had friends, but even his friends were picking up stones to throw at him because he was to blame for what had happened. So David bore the pain of losing his wives. He bore the pain of the men who he trusted turning against him. And he bore the pain of knowing that at the end of the day, it was his fault because of the bad decisions he had made. I wonder if there are times in any of your lives, something happens which just a little bit mirrors that. People that you trust just don't come up with the goods. Things that are precious to you let down and you feel a sense of failure because the way that you have or haven't really looked after your family as well as you should have done. You haven't looked after the people around you as well as you shouldn't have done. And it all seems to go wrong. And you look around for some comfort you find someone to try and give you some encouragement, there's nobody there. And the answer, my friend, is to encourage yourself, to strengthen yourself in the Lord, your God. Now, it doesn't actually tell us in the text what David did, but 
That's why I want to suggest to you, he just might have picked up his lyre or his guitar, if you like, using our parlance, and just said to himself, well, it's been a long time since I've picked this up, a long time since I've sung anything to God, but I'm just going to do that. And he did it. And he just might have composed this Psalm 22. So let's look at it from just for a few minutes. He starts off, interestingly, by sort of blaming God. My God, why are you far from me? Why don't you listen to me? And there's always a tendency sometimes when things go wrong that we sort of think it's God who should have stepped in. God, why did you allow this to happen? Why didn't you stop this person from dying? Why didn't you stop this problem happening in my business? Why, why, why? But then we see after that, as I said earlier, a sort of progression as David climbs himself out of this despair. And the three steps really on the journey he took. First step we find is that he reminds himself that there have been times past when God's faithfulness has been incontrovertible. God's faithfulness has been beyond dispute. God's faithfulness has proved itself. And I want to say to you, my friends, there are times when things are really hard and we just have to stop and think, well, yes, I know stories of old when God has been amazingly faithful to his people. You might struggle even in your own life to see that, but you might have read a missionary story. You might have heard a story of your grandparents. You might have heard of something that happened and thought to yourself, well, Yes, just as David said here, in our fathers, in you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. It's as though David's saying, well, it worked for them, so just maybe it might work for me. Maybe things aren't quite so bad. Maybe you are a God I can trust in. But then he dips down again, you see. But then he come, dips down and talks about, I'm not a worm, I'm no man, I'm scorned. And, and he goes back into despair, if you like. But he doesn't quite reach the bottom. He climbs back again. And we find the second stage, if you like, we see later in the psalm. He says, not only does he look back and see the way God has been faithful to others in the past, to his fathers, so to speak, but he looks back and sees ways in which God has been faithful to him. He'd almost forgotten. He said, you are he who took me, verse 9, you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. So sometimes part of the process of strengthening ourselves in the Lord our God, is to remind ourselves, maybe in the dim and distant past, something God did for you. Just remember. Maybe you'll thumb through the pages of a diary or a journal and say, yes, that was the point. That was the point when things were going badly, and I remember now I prayed to God, and he was there. He cared for me. I was dependent upon him like a child at a mother's breast. I was dependent upon him and he didn't let me down. And maybe because he didn't let me down then, he won't let me down now. So David would have remembered. Maybe David remembered the time that he took up a stone and threw it at the forehead of Goliath and thought, wow, if God could help me then, maybe God can help me now. And then he goes down again. Then he goes down. There's many balls in company, strong balls of patience around when he, he poured, he, I'm poured out like water. And you have this graphic description of the way he felt. And it seems as though he's going to go back into the mire again. And sometimes it's like that, my friend. Sometimes there'll be times when you feel a little bit of hope. Things are coming together a little bit. You start to understand. But then maybe it's, you wake up in the morning and you've had a difficult night's sleep and all of a sudden it all comes over you again. You think, oh, why, why, oh, why is this happening? Do you know, I feel, I feel so sad and sorry for people 
people that have worked hard in particular directions, work hard to look after a family, work hard to get a business going, and it's just gone, and it just comes in waves over them. Why, oh why has this happened? But it's interesting if we look at this, the third stage that David seems to come to in his psalm, not so much looking back at what God did for his forefathers, not so much even looking back for what he did for him, <clears throat> but he decides, interestingly, that he's gonna start speaking out about what God has done. He says, quite surprisingly in verse 22, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. All who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. And I can just imagine David seeing this song in the story that I, I, I referred to in, in Samuel. The, the colleagues of David, his mighty men around him, they were standing around him and they took up stones to throw at him. And you can almost imagine David reaching out, picking up his, his, his lyre, his, his, his instrument, and starting to sing. And he looked around at the men and said, you just need to give thanks to God. You need to praise him. Tell of the good things he's done. <clears throat> and David was struggling to think of the good things, but he spoke them out. And I say to you, my friends, <clears throat> sometimes when things are difficult, it just helps to ring somebody up and say, do you know, God is good. You might not feel it very much, but the speaking out of it somehow drives it into your consciousness and you realise, yes, God is good. And the vocalising of it, the sharing it with others, hearing others do it, singing a song of praise to God is part of the process of restoration. And so he ends up by saying, God, I believe, is not despised or abhorred the afflicted. He has not hidden his face. He has heard when he cried to him. <clears throat> now, you may say to me, <clears throat> you may say to me, well, Jeff, it's still hard. It's still tough. And it is hard. It's not easy. I won't pretend that these are kind of silver bullets that kind of solve the problem. But I suggest to you that there's something in this psalm that teaches us how we can deal with those moments of gloom and despair that arise. But one more thing I want to say before I close, and that's I'm going to come back to what I said earlier, that this psalm is a remarkable depiction of Jesus' feelings and sentiments and words on the cross. On the cross, Jesus quoted this psalm, which is an astonishing thing in itself. He cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, the writers of the gospels give it in the Aramaic language, as if to reinforce the significance of what Jesus was saying. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So move for a moment, and then <clears throat> move for this imaginary scene in David, David's history. Move with me to the cross and hear those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What does that say to, what does that say to us in our moments of despair? Well, I think it says, <clears throat> I think it says three things, briefly. I think one thing it says is that Whatever we go through, Jesus has been through that much worse. Whatever we suffer, Jesus knows what it is to suffer. The writer of the Hebrews says he's able to sympathize with us because he's been there before. So when we come in our prayers, when we cry out to him, when we cry out, why, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus would say to us, well, I know what it's like. I'll suffer. I've suffered that and I'll walk the journey with you. But I think more than that, also, when we hear Jesus cry, <clears throat> my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We hear that, we hear him say to us, I knew what it was to be forsaken so that you will never know what it is. You will never need to know what it is to be forsaken. I actually went through that, but you never will, because there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. The things that would have separated you from the love of God, that would have caused that prayer to have been answered by God saying, no, I don't hear you. No, I won't answer you. No, I'm not going to listen to you. No, I won't listen to your prayer. The things that would have driven a wedge between you and God have been dismissed because of what Jesus did on the cross. He was forsaken so that I will never need to be forsaken. And of course, thirdly, that cry of Jesus from the cross was followed by a cry when he said, it is finished. When he said, I've dealt with it. 
I've solved the problem. You are forgiven. So come back to David again for a moment. And uh, the parallel that might be with their own lives. If you feel that the problems that have come upon you are partly because of mistakes you've made, and we all live with that. We live with the fact that we've done things that we wish we hadn't done them, or we've not done things which we had done. The cry of Jesus from the cross is the cry which says, you're forgiven. I've sorted out. The guilt has gone, as that little song that we sang earlier. For every sin on him was laid. We can start afresh, just like David was able to put behind him the regrets and the pain that he felt for what he'd done and know the forgiveness of God. So we can also. So I leave that with you. Maybe you're going through something at the moment. Maybe it's trying to walk hand in hand with someone who is. <clears throat> Encourage that person. Don't be scared about shouting at God. Don't be frightened about shouting to God and saying, where were you when I needed you? But allow yourself to believe that, yes, God has been faithful in the past. Allow yourself to believe that God has even been faithful to you in the past in ways that you might have forgotten. And allow yourself to believe that by speaking out God's faithfulness, God, by his spirit, might actually birth within you a hope which otherwise might not seem possible. And then come and stand just for a moment at the cross and hear Jesus say, I was forsaken, I was abandoned, I was left alone. So I know what it's like. But more than that, Jesus didn't just go to the cross so that he could sympathize with us. He went to the cross to deal with the issues which would have separated us from God. And that now is forever gone. So, when things are difficult, remember the words David encourage himself in the Lord his God and you my friends can encourage yourselves in the Lord your God. Lord I pray that will be our experience. Lord I pray that when the valley seems a bit dark and deep and the pathway seems hard I pray that each of us sitting around this little zoom collection this morning will prove what it means to strengthen ourselves in you, for Jesus' sake. Amen.